Allora, buonasera, benvenute, benvenuti. Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the fourth lecture of our series dedicated to Botticelli that we have co-organized with, with the Center of um, Renaissance Studies of the Newberry Library. And I would like to thank especially uh, Leah Marchi, the director of the, of the center here with us. Uh, we have chosen with Leah to organize this series of lecture to um, introduce, give a context uh, and also service to our public in connection to the um, exhibition Botticelli and Renaissance Florence uh, that uh, has been inaugurated on October 6, uh, the Minneapolis Institute of Art until January 8. We have had a um, lecture by Professor Luba Friedman, followed by Professor uh, Neil Atkinson, then uh, Jonathan Nelson, and tonight, today, we have Professor Jamie, uh, Dr. Jamie Gabarelli here with us, uh, who will introduce us to the uh, printmaking and drawing in the Florence of Botticelli. Jamie uh, is a Prince Trust Associate Curator in Prints and Drawings at the Art Institute in Chicago, where he oversees the collection of European works on paper from the 15th to the 18th centuries. His research uh, is focusing on uh, artistic exchanges between Italy and Northern Europe, on the history of printmaking techniques, and on the relationship between prints and other media. Uh, Jamie is from a uh, native of Assisi, but also a British citizen, and he graduated at Oxford University Corpus Christi College, holds an MA from the Walburg Institute in London, and a PhD in Art History and Renaissance Studies from uh, Ray Yale University. He's currently preparing an exhibition about the shared history of drawing and printmaking, and we are extremely honored uh, to have him with us and thankful for uh, that he has accepted our invitation. So I will leave the floor. I will just remind that this lecture will be recorded and it will be soon available on our YouTube channel. Who is following uh, the lecture at home will be able to uh, use the Q&A tab to ask questions. But of course, we encourage everyone to come and visit the stay with us in presence for the next time. So at the end, Jamie will will uh, wait for your questions uh, to open a discussion on, uh, on the topic. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jamie. I'll leave the floor. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the Instituto Italiano di Cultura and the Newbury for inviting me um, to speak about uh, this wonderful topic. And um, thank you for coming. In May, 1893, the Grand Beaux-Arts building that is home to the Art Institute of Chicago first opened its doors to the public an inauguration perfectly timed to coincide with the world's first Colombian exposition, which the city was hosting that year. Carved on the frieze that wraps around the temple-like building, just under the pediment and roof, are the names of artists who were at the time deemed to be the most important, if almost exclusively Western European, in the art of historical canon. Remarkably, the name of Botticelli features prominently on the front of the building, next to that of Leonardo da Vinci. I say remarkably not because Botticelli was not an extremely talented, seductive, and interesting artist, but because 1893 was also the year that the first ever monograph on the artist was published, ending centuries of scholarly neglect. In 1893, the great art and cultural historian Abbey Warburg also completed his dissertation on Botticelli's famous mythologies, the Primavera and the Birth of Venus, which is still required reading for modern scholars of Renaissance art. While today those paintings are virtually synonymous with Florence and the Renaissance in popular imagination, Botticelli's work was not widely known, appreciated or collected from the time of his death until the slow rediscovery that started in the 19th century. But in 1893, the Art Institute of Chicago did not own a single work by Botticelli, something that changed only in 1954 with the gift of two beautiful paintings from a private collection, one of which I'm showing you here. To this day, the names carved on the museum building are less a catalog of what is to be found inside, but an expression of what our fellow Chicagoans aspired to as they welcomed the world to their city. 
And it is with this thought that I, as a curator in prints and drawings, should say right away that regrettably our museum does not own a single drawing by Botticelli. But that is hardly surprising. Italian art was not the principal focus of early collecting at the museum, and even if it had been, obtaining a drawing by Botticelli would have been an arduous task. If we exclude his drawings related to Dante, which I shall mention later, only around 12 sheets by the hand of the artists are thought to survive today. They are mostly in museum collections in Europe. But the landmark exhibition on the artist now on view at the Minneapolis Institute of Art encouraged me to use Botticelli as a connecting link between artistic developments in the graphic arts at the end of the 15th century, the storied paradigmatic time of Lorenzo il Magnifico. Instead of trying to provide an exhaustive overview of that extremely dense and eventful historical period, I decided to focus on three works that were made during Botticelli's lifetime uh, that embody some of the major developments in drawing and printmaking in Florence at the height of its artistic flowering. All three works are in Chicago, but they are connected to drawings and prints that feature in the Minneapolis exhibition. The three works will help me introduce three topics that seemed relevant to a discussion of printing and drawing in Renaissance Florence. The renewed focus on drawing from life, the rediscovery of ancient art, and Botticelli's influence on the graphic arts in the closing decades of the Quattrocento. In late 2020, the Art Institute of Chicago acquired what is now arguably its most important Renaissance drawing. It is a meticulous study of drapery made with fine brushes and transparent and opaque watercolor on linen prepared with a gray green ground, a highly unusual support for drawing. Beneath the cascading folds and volum of voluminous cloth, we perceive the solid forms of a standing body, but the artist has otherwise paid little attention to it, barely jotting down the outlines of its upper part. Instead, the draftsman's focus, collected, unstinting, and almost forensic, zeroes in on the ponderous fabric, lingering on its prismatic shapes and on the play of light on its unpredictable forms. If we look closer, we notice the delicacy with which the white pigment was applied in sharp, vivid lines or in blended areas of gradient tone. This close-up view also makes us wonder at how something with such astonishing mimetic power was created with a surprising economy of means, just a few feather-like brush strokes almost whispered onto the surface. And that textured surface, the warp and weft still visible through the pigment, linen being used to depict linen, heightens the hallucinatory realism of this deceptively simple study. The drawing has a haptic quality. We can easily imagine what it would feel to touch what is so vividly depicted. It appears to record the encounter with a real singular object, but at the same time, to our modern eyes, emanates the seductive, melancholy charm of a fragment. This beautiful study was made in Florence around 1470 by an artist that has not been unanimously or definitively identified. What we do know, however, is that it was made in the workshop of the sculptor, painter, draftsman, and goldsmith, Andrea del Verrocchio. A true Renaissance man with a remarkable range of competencies, Verrocchio was the leading sculptor of his generation in Italy. The prosperous and successful bottega he ran in Florence was also a remarkably fertile training ground for exceptionally talented young artists. Verrocchio's pupils and assistants included Pietro Perugino, Francesco Botticini, Lorenzo di Credi, Domenico Ghirlandaio, and most famously, Leonardo da Vinci, who moved to Florence in the mid 1460s and spent seven years as a garzone or apprentice in Verrocchio's workshop. Verrocchio also exerted a strong influence on Botticelli himself, although we do not know if he spent any time training or working with the master. Like other Florentine botteghe at the time, Verrocchio's workshop was a place of learning and collaborative making. The ultimate aim for the pupils was to train their eye and hand to assimilate the style of their teacher so as to become almost indistinguishable from him. Something which makes assigning the authorship of workshop production to, to this or that individual more complicated. As a case in point, the Chicago drawing belongs to a group of 16 drapery studies, now divided among a number of museums that are virtually identical in their unusual technique, their use of prepared linen as a support, 
as opposed to customary paper, um, sets them apart as a unique category in the 15th century. Their execution, however, is not uniform. Two studies at the Louvre, where six of the drawings are today, come very close to the Chicago work. Both focus on billowing drapery gathering around the legs of a standing figure in profile. The folds themselves vary, but the arrangement of the fabric is similar. It is possible that the three drawings were made by the same artist, but by no means certain. Another drawing now at the Uffizi is also closely connected um, to our study, but even though the sketchy treatment of the figure is comparable, the handling of the folds appears more fluid, less angular, perhaps suggesting a different hand. In this case, according to scholarly consensus, that of Leonardo da Vinci. Our drawing, on the other hand, has been variously attributed to Leonardo, Verrocchio, or an unidentified pupil in his workshop. But how exactly do we know that they all stem from Verrocchio's workshop? In addition to stylistic similarities with draperies in Verrocchio's paintings and sculpture, we also have a remarkable testimony from Giorgio Vasari, the 16th century artist and biographer whose Lives of the Artists, first published in 1550, is still the foundational text for art history of Renaissance Florence. In the expanded life of Leonardo, included in the second edition of the Vita in 1568, Vasari describes the making of these exceptional studies. Here he is discussing Leonardo's apprenticeship with Verrocchio. Since he, Leonardo, wished painting to be his profession, he practiced intently to portray things from life and sometimes to make clay model figures on which he would put wet clay dipped rags and then go about patiently portraying them on some very fine rinse cloths and other prepared linens. And he worked on them in black and white with the tip of a brush, which was a miraculous thing as witnessed by a number of these drawings that I have by his hand in my Libro di Disegni. But Nari's precise description, sorry, um, a description of the idiosyncratic medium leaves little doubt that the 16 surviving drawings were produced in the same context as Leonardo's. His description also reveals that these painsta painstaking observations from life were not executed from a live model donning heavy lengths of drapery, but rather drawn from small tabletop clay figurines clad in linen, in linen soaked in liquid clay so that it would acquire a useful plastic stiffness. Vasari's reference to his Libro di Disegni, an album in which he avidly collected and organized drawings by artists included in the Vitae, raises the possibility that all 16 drawings of draperies, including the Chicago study, were once part of the biographer's distinguished collection. Indeed, in the 17th century, the studies were acquired by the eminent collector Everard Diabach, who had purchased much of the contents of Vasari's collection. It has been suggested that the Chicago study and the two drawings at the Louvre were made when Verrocchio was planning one of his most famous sculptural works, Christ and St. Thomas, the double bronze created for one of the niches on the exterior of the church of Orsa Michele in Florence. The Tribunale de la Mercancia assigned the commission to, uh, for the bronze to Verrocchio in 1466, but the sculpture was not entirely completed until 1483. There are undoubtedly similarities between the studies taken from the, from the clay figurines seen uh, from the side and the side view of the bronze Christ with one arm bent at the elbow uh, from which drapery folds fan out in widening loops. But the extravagant, extravagant accumulation of folds in the bronze is much more complex than any of these studies, which needn't be thought of as preparatory in the traditional sense of the word. In the context of Verrocchio's workshop, it is not clear whether these drawings were executed for a specific commission, or perhaps as a more independent exercise in observation. After all, repeatedly sketching from the clay models would allow the artist to internalize the liquid logic of folding fabric and to enable them to replicate it in convincing ways. Whatever the case, this type of sketch is a powerful example of the radical artistic shift that occurred in 15th century, particularly in Florence. In the medium of drawing, um, throughout the century, Florentine artists demonstrated a grow growing interest in the mimetic transcription of reality based on observation and on drawing from life, rather than on copying pre-existing models or the examples of other masters. Sketching from life was an exercise that trained both eye and the hand, 
It takes makers, uh, it teaches makers how to look as well as how to draw. And the resulting studies could serve in the creation of works in other media, such as sculptures or paintings, which in the course of the century appear to strive for ever greater verisimilitude. Another wonderful example of this type of drawing, uh, also uh, incubated in Verrocchio's workshop, is included in the Minneapolis exhibition, a highly developed uh, study of drapery by Lorenzo Di Credi, this time executed on the more traditional technique of metal point on prepared paper. Once again, the sculptural arrangement of the textiles is the artist's princi principal focus, while the upper body of the figure, in this case an allegorical figure of astronomy, is only summarily sketched in with black chalk. In his Life of Lorenzo Di Credi, Vasari again places this particular type of drapery study in the context of Verrocchio's orbit. And here is Vasari's quote. Lorenzo places himself, placed himself as an apprentice with Andrea del Verrocchio and having in that workshop as friends, albeit also as competitors, Pietro Perugino and Leonardo da Vinci, he devoted himself with diligence to painting, as can be seen in many drawings in metal point in pen or watercolor, which are in my book, among which are some portraits of clay models covered with wax linen dipped in liquid clay, so painstakingly reproduced and so carefully finished that one can hardly believe it, let alone do it oneself." End quote. Vasari's disbelief about the hypnotic force of these observational drawings is a reaction we still experience today. Sketching from life was not limited to studio props or live models, however. Increasingly, ancient art, and in particular ancient sculpture, became an important model, something which challenged Renaissance artists not only to replicate it, but to surpass that august precedent. The goldsmith, sculptor, and painter Antonio del Polariolo was, together with his brother Piero, one of the most significant Florentine artists of his generation. At the height of his career, around the time Botticelli was starting his. Pollaiolo's busy workshop, which produced a variety of works in uh, different media, mainly for Medici and ecclesiastical patronage, was quite similar and therefore a main competitor to that of Verrocchio. While Pollaiolo was trained as a goldsmith and therefore, therefore perfectly familiar with the technique of engraving in metal, he produced only a single print, the, enig the Enigmatic Battle of the Nudes, an exceptional work in more ways than one. At 40 by 60 centimeters, it is perhaps the largest engraving made in the 15th century. It is also among the very first that were signed with a maker's name. Most Florentine 15th century engravings are neither signed nor dated, but here Pollaiolo formally inscribed his name in Latin capital letters on the tablet at the left a tabula ansata, a favorite framing device for inscriptions in the ancient world. The engraving depicts a violent scene of combat between 10 nude muscular men who look rather indeed suspiciously alike. The taut figures arranged symmetrically in five dynamic pairs in front of a dense vegetal background, recall the dynamic bodies and spectacular and specular composition arrangements um, encountered on ancient Roman friezes and sculpted sarcophagi a similarity reinforced by the print's oblong format and its shallow fictive space. While their weapons, including shields, swords, and chains, suggest a reference to gladiatorial combat, the men are not the protagonists of a narrative episode. While many scholars have attempted to detect and decode a story in this striking composition, the print is unlikely to be an illustration. Rather, it appears to be a virtuoso display both of the artist's technical dexterity with the burin, the engraver's tool, and of his talent for invention and disegno, in particular for the convincing depiction of the nude male body in strenuous action. It seems that Vasari also interpreted the print in a similar fashion. Here he is in, the, uh, in his life of Polaiuolo. He understood the nude figure in a more modern way than other masters had before him and he flayed many corpses to see the anatomy underneath. And he was one of the first to demonstrate how to seek the muscles that would have, um, that would have shape and order in the figures. And of all those bound with a chain, he engraved a battle on copper. And after that, he made other prints with a much better engraving technique than previous masters had employed." End quote. 
And even though Barazari said that he engraved more prints, we, um, we don't know of any Mithias. So they don't survive if he did. Vasari here calls attention to Polaiola's commitment to observation, which in, in his case apparently included anatomical dissection, as well as to the fact that knowledge of such matters was seen as something to be praised and admired. Such dedication to the pursuit of lifelikeness was at the core of what Vasari termed modern, a precondition for the maniera moderna of the high Renaissance. To contemporary viewers, the battle's engagement with ancient art was another key component of its modernity, of its up-to-dateness. Indeed, as we shall see, the link between Polaiola's print and ancient sculpture is more intimate than has often been recognized, a connection that is emblematic of the Renaissance obsession with recovering the past and recasting it for the present. In February 1489, the Medici agent in Rome, Luigi da Barberino, wrote a letter to Lorenzo il Magnifico in Florence. In it, he related the news that some ancient sculptures had been unearthed in the grounds of the convent of San Lorenzo in Panisperna. And quote, the great desire, Luigi wrote, that I have that your magnificence should have some ancient works, and especially beautiful ones, has made me break the silence I have kept for some time about this subject. Luigi went on to say that his intermediary, Giovanni Ciampolini, entered the convent grounds under cover of night and, quote, found three beautiful little fawns and a small marble base, all three bound together by a great snake. And even if one cannot hear their voices, they seem to breathe and cry out and defend themselves with wonderful gestures. That one in the middle you see almost falling down and expiring. These Ciampolini has promised will be entirely ours and they will cost 50 ducats. And even if they might not be worth exactly that sum, he must satisfy the demands of his accomplice so that he won't tell anyone. When you see them, you will judge them that you have spent the money well." End quote. So why did Ciampolini need to buy his partner's silence? Because as soon as the statue was unearthed, the powerful Cardinal Giuliano della Rovere the future Pope Julius II, had been to see it and ordered that nothing from the site should be given away or sold, nor should anything be excavated because he wanted all the finds for his own collection. Hence the need for a nocturnal raid. The, the astonishing level of subterfuge and bribing, if not outright dishonesty, involved in procuring the satire group from, for Florence is an eloquent reminder of how eager and ruthless elite Italian collectors such as Lorenzo were to get their hands on extremely uh, excellent examples of ancient sculpture. In the end, the, sculpt the sculptural group was smuggled out of Florence on the 4th of April, 1489, when it was packed into a crate carried by a mule, along with a broken off arm that had also been recovered nearby. From here on, the documentary trail stops, and we have no written record of the arrival of the struggling fawns in Florence nor of their inclusion in Lorenzo's collection. Visual evidence, however, would suggest that Lorenzo did indeed acquire the statue. Between 1490 and 1492, Michelangelo was working on a classicizing marble relief depicting a battle of the centaurs for Lorenzo. And two figures in Michelangelo's work appear to be modeled on the two lateral figures of the newly discovered Roman group. A clear echo of the central figure, which has been singled out for precise description in the letter to Lorenzo, also reappears in Polaiuolo's Battle of the Nudes. Not only the general pose of the semi-recumbent body caught in a violent struggle, but the position of the head and its highly dramatic expression seem to have to leave no doubt that Polaiuolo saw the Sata group before he created his masterpiece of early Italian engraving. He certainly had the opportunity to do so, but when the statue was unearthed in 1489, Polaiolo was not in his native Florence, but in Rome, working on designing and producing a monumental tomb for Pope Sixtus IV. Polaiolo had received this prestigious commission from none other than Giuliano della Rovere, the cardinal who had rushed to see the Sata group when it was first dug out of the ground. It seems likely then that Polaiolo would have gone to the convent of San Lorenzo with, or shortly after, his patron, to see the rediscovered artwork and perhaps make sketches of these novel looking and dramatically expressive forms. 
This incredibly well-documented episode paints a vivid picture of the acute sense of excitement that surrounded the physical and intellectual rediscovery of ancient art in the Renaissance. As we saw, the effect of these archeological discoveries on 15th century artists, particularly Florentine ones, was almost immediate. But Polaiola's Battle of the Nudes was not just a slavish imitation, rather it was an original reimagining inspired by the encounter with something previously unknown. Though ancient sculpture was one of its sources, Polaiolo's engraving in turn became an incredibly popular model for other Renaissance artists in Italy and beyond. Judging by the rather worn quality of most surviving impressions, it must have been printed in large numbers, both an impression of the print and the sculptural group of the satyrs, which has been on loan from, to the Art Institute since it was acquired uh, at auction in 2012, has currently, is currently on view uh, in the exhibition in the Minneapolis Institute of Art. On the 30th of August, 1481, the final page of a landmark publication was printed in Florence by the German-born book printer Nicolò di Lorenzo della Magna, a native of Breslau, who had settled in the city since at least 1464. Shown here in the example preserved at the Newbury Library, the impressive volume printed on full folio sheets with an elegant humanist Roman type was the first Florentine printed edition of Dante's Divine Comedy. Though it was by no means the first edition of that capital work to appear in Italy, at least eight others had preceded it, starting with the one printed in Foligno in 1472, the publication held a special significance in the construction of civic identity and cultural pride at the time when Lorenzo il Magnifico's influence over the city was at its peak. As you can see, Dante's verses were physically and visually surrounded by a copious commentary written by Cristoforo Landino, a professor of poetry and rhetoric at the Florentine Studio, or as the university was called at the time, and a teacher of Lorenzo de' Medici himself. When the printing was completed, Landino, in an elaborate piece of civic theater, presented a copy printed on parchment to the Signoria during a public ceremony. That volume is still in Florence at the Biblioteca Nazionale. And also gave a speech, swiftly published as a pamphlet, in which he couched his scholarly undertaking in a long Florentine history of great achievements that he traced back to Dante himself. In closing the speech, Landino hoped that his fellow citizens would, quote, congratulate your most splendid birthplace to which the highest God has given such a great gift and frequently read your poet, El Vostro Poeta, the first splendor of the Florentine name, end quote. Much more than the scholarly publication, the book was a deft attempt to reclaim the great poet for the city that had exiled him, to bring Dante back to Florence. This high profile editorial undertaking was accompanied by equally lofty typographic ambitions. Since Landino's was, the first, was to be the first fully illustrated edition of the Divine Comedy ever to appear on the market. Remarkably, Instead of the usual medium of woodcut widely used for book illustrations, it was to be illustrated with copper plate engravings printed on the same sheet as the text. The innovation was as challenging as it was revolutionary, and it was undoubtedly intended to showcase Florence's preeminence in technological know-how. Indeed, Nicola de la Magna earned the distinction of being the first printer ever to publish a book illustrated with engravings, when in 1477, he issued Antonio Bettini's devotional treatise, Montesanto di Dio, accompanied by three full page engraved plates. The most well known of them is perhaps uh, the Holy Mountain, an impression of which is at the Art Institute. This allegorical diagrammatic illustration shows a humbly robed friar climbing a ladder whose rungs are the different virtues and practices that would ensure one's ascent to heaven and eternal salvation, symbolized by Christ at uh, the top, surrounded by an angelic host. In contrast to the humble but virtuous friar, a young gentleman dressed in elegant finery has fallen prey to the devil, who binds the man's foot with a snare-like banderol that reads blindness. The technique of engraving on copper produced images with uh, a much greater degree of detail and nuance than traditional woodcuts. 
they were a significant aesthetic advancement. But printing them also required a different type of press than the mobile type used in letterpress. That meant that each sheet that included an illustration had to be first passed through a screw press to receive the text. And then when the ink had dried, uh, the sheet would be dampened again and passed through a roller press to produce the printed image with the copper engraving carefully aligned with the text and the blank spaces. Now, the extra steps may have been manageable uh, when, the when there were only three illustrations, uh, as was the case in the Montesanto di Dio. But in the case of Dante, the publisher had envisaged one copper plate per illustration for each of the 100 cantos of the Commedia. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the initial grand ambitions did not materialize. Only 19 of the planned 100 engravings were e ever executed, and only two uh, for the first and the second cantos were ever printed on the same sheet as the text. The remaining 17 were printed on separate pieces of paper, which were then glued into some copies of the books. Very curiously, in the Newbery copy, uh, when only uh, the first two engravings were printed, as was the case with most uh, surviving copies, but the, the blank spaces of, in the following 17 were filled in with drawn copies of the prints done in pen, ink, and wash by an unknown, probably 19th century draftsperson. The possible reasons for this failure are many and complex, but the original intentions are beyond doubt. At the beginning of or end of every canto in the poem, the typographer left a blank space to accommodate the second printing for the never completed engravings. And the surviving contract drawn up in 1480 between Landino, Niccolò di Lorenzo, and an investor by the name of Bernardo degli Alberti specified that Bernardo would put down 260 florins for, quote, pay for day to day expenses for the illustrations, le storie, and for the salaries of the assistants hired to print these volumes. Though his name is never mentioned anywhere in the publication or in the extant documents, the designs for the prints were provided by none other than Sandra Bocicelli. The unusual involvement uh, of one of the most sought after painters of the day in a typographic venture is perhaps more understandable if we think of Landino's close connection to Lorenzo de' Medici, one of Botticelli's principal patrons. In his Life of Botticelli, Giorgio Vasari discussed the publication saying, quote, Botticelli returned immediately to Florence where, because he was a man of knowledge, he wrote a partial commentary on Dante and he illustrated the Inferno and had it made into prints, an activity in which he consumed a great deal of time, end quote. Vasari goes on to say that Botticelli had, uh, quote, many other designs that he had uh, made translated into print, but they were of poor quality for the engraving was not well done. Vasari was never a huge fan of printmaking. <laughs> the engravings in Landino's Dante are usually attributed to Baccio Baldini, uh, a goldsmith and engraver about whom we know very little. The traditional attribution is, however, supported by another passage in Vasari's Vitae. In his life of Marcantonio Raimondi, after wrongly and tendentiously claiming that engraving had been developed in Florence, it certainly hadn't, Vasari related that one of its first prestic practitioners was Baccio Baldini, Florentine goldsmith, who, because he was not a good draftsman, executed everything he did working after the inventions and designs of Sandro Botticelli. End quote. While far from being the most accomplished engravings of their time, Botticelli's horizontal compositions are notable for their narrative and clever ways. Um, so notable for, the, for their narrative and the clever, um, the clear ways they managed to include multiple narrative moments on each small plate. For instance, in this, the illustration to the first canto on the opening page, we see Dante three times. The narrative progresses from the left to the right. Uh, on the left, we see a forlorn Dante on the uh, uh, on his own in the thick of the Silva Oscura, the symbolic dark forest that is mentioned in the first lines of the poem. In the center, we see Dante emerging out of the forest and looking up at the summit of a hill illuminated by a ray of light coming from on high. As Dante writes, guardai in alto e vidi le sue spalle, vestite già dei raggi del pianeta. On the right of the plate, Dante begins to ascend the mountain, 
when he is suddenly set upon and threatened by three beasts, a leopard, the lonza leggera, a lion, and the she-wolf, who forces him to start retreating away from the light and back towards the forest. In the poem, as he is descending, Dante is startled by the appearance of a, the spirit of Virgil, the Roman poet who acts as Dante's guide to the underworld, and who in the print appears from behind a rock in front of a terrified Dante. In a unified space, Botticelli provided a visual synopsis of the, visual synopsis of the whole canto. Similarly, in the illustration placed at the opening of the, of the second canto, Dante and Virgil are seen talking, for the canto opens with the Roman poet explaining the journey ahead to Dante. Virgil then recounts how Beatrice, Dante's beloved and a denizen of heaven, appeared to him, asking him to help and guide Dante through the underworld. Virgil's account takes visual form in the print in the shape of a small female figure in the sky radiating light. And uh, as quote, Lucevan gli occhi suoi più che la stella, her eyes surpassed the splendor of the stars, as Virgil states in the canto. Close to the upper right corner of the illustration, a door is visible just um, uh, near the top of the, of the hill. Above it, the words per me, through me, inscribed uh, above the entrance of hell are the, the same words that um, open the, the third canto of the inferno signaling to the viewer what lies ahead. Botticelli's ingenious economy seems to support Lazari's claim that he was intimately familiar with Dante's poem. His use of continuous narrative is a compositional strategy he would employ repeatedly in his secular paintings. But it is also the hallmark of perhaps his greatest achievement as a draftsman, a group of large scale drawings on parchment illustrating most of the commedia which Botticelli apparently made for Lorenzo di Pier Francesco de' Medici, Lorenzo il Magnifico's cousin. 92 such drawings survive today, divided between the Vatican Library and the Berlin print room. That project, uh, also apparently left unfinished, is often confused with Landino's publication and Baldini's engravings. And the relationship between the two endeavors is indeed not entirely clear. But connected they certainly are, as we can see, for instance, if we compare the sadly, sadly much damaged pen and ink drawing for the first canto at the Vatican with Baldini's printed illustration. The poet stranded in the forest, his encounter with the beasts and his startling encounter with Virgil are all there in the same sequence. But the drawing contains much more detail. Dante appears four times, not three, and important elements such as the scale of the forest and the rays of light differ. What is certain is that Baldini's engravings do not reproduce Botticelli's drawings on parchment. The prints may have been based on preliminary studies for the vellum sheets. Uh, they may be simplified versions of the finished drawings, or they may have even been the inspiration behind the more ambitious project for Lorenzo di Pierfrancesco. Now is certainly not the time to open Pandora's box. And before we stray too far from the subject and from the Midwest, I would like to thank again the Italian Cultural Institute and the Newbury Library. And I hope this detour has piqued your curiosity for the wonderful Florentine prints and drawings we have uh, here in Chicago, as well as those that are on view in Minneapolis until January the 8th. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, very much. It's been a very interesting and uh, enlightening uh, uh, lecture. If there are any questions from uh, from our audience here? I just ask you the kindness to speak on the microphone so that people can. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk, very enlightening. I do want to ask you about this drawing that you have on the screen, notwithstanding the fact that Vasari says he has the collection in his Libro de Disegni. I, it's remarkable to me that it isn't what we would consider a drawing. It is brushwork with watercolor on linen. And I think it merits a few more comments. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about it. I'm really struck by this. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, no, that's a, a very <laughs> valid uh, question, and that's the one that I was trying to avoid. Um, 
if it's, um, we consider it a drawing, I think, because of its um, its function or the function that it's, uh, it appeared to serve in the workshop, which was uh, a didactic uh, or preparatory, perhaps, uh, function, which is usually uh, uh, reserved to sheets of paper. Um, some drawings are executed with brush on paper and nobody would dispute they are drawings. Uh, but in this case, the, it's quite exceptional. I mean, we don't have a category for this kind of work because there's only 16 of them. Um, and you could say it's a, a bozzetto, a painted bozzetto. And I wouldn't dispute or battle that, with that definition, but I think that the, its function and, and how it was created was more similar to uh, a, a draftsman activity than, uh, than that of a painter. Uh, but I think, yeah, we're, we're sort of splitting here. <laughs> There's no more questions, uh, uh, then I will just encourage everyone uh, to visit Minneapolis Institute of Art exhibition. You have uh, still a month. And of course, visit the, 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 the wonderful uh, section of the Art Institute uh, curated also by, by Jamie. So thank you again very much. Thank you, Jamie. It's been a pleasure.